I am so excited to have Javier Hernandez, Javier Hernandez talk about the recreating the new mythos, the race, Latinx comics, El Muerto. Welcome, Javi. Hey, it's good to be here. Uh, socially distanced as we are by the thousands of miles, but thank you, Professor Latinx. So, you know, what's your origin story, Javier, for those who um, are new to you and your work? Like, like, was it, I imagine you were just either in diapers or fresh out of diapers and you, ma you made your way to that first comic book, but let us hear from you. Yeah, I was bitten by a radioactive comic book as a child. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I, I don't know, I don't know if it's a late start or what, but I was probably about eight, eight or nine when my older brother, Albert, he gave me this magic treasure trove of uh, comics. He used to collect comics. And by the time he was in high school, he just got bored of them. So I got this, it's almost a shopping bag full of comics. And they're all dated from like 69, 70, 71. So they were Marvel DC comics. So, you know, for I don't know how many times I reread those, you know, 30 or 40 comics, but I got the cream of the Marvel crop, DC crop, Neil Adams, Batman, Jack Kirby, Fantastic Four, John Romita, Spider-Man, a lot of reprints of early Steve Ditko. And um, so, like I said, probably about eight-year-old, I got hit with a box of comics. Let's put it that way. Yeah, you know, that was, uh, gosh, right when I was born, um, I was still in Mexico, but I know right, gosh, right after that moment, we got hit with all the cool, uh, more cool characters, right? With um, right around 74. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So you were right in the thick of it. Um, was there one in particular that you kind of look back at as being like, wow, this really is like the seed for my comics book superhero? Well, the, the artistry would have been Jack Kirby, you know, his dynamic, full figured, uh, almost like a Diego Rivera, big blocky figures. I made that connection later as a, in college, but it was the power of Kirby's storytelling, Jack Kirby's storytelling, the dynamicism of the uh, movement, the, the drama of the characters, uh, character design. I, I saw that character design, although I didn't think of it that way as a kid, but how important it is, the visual characterization of each character. But the comic, the one that would, you know, instill in me the idea of uh, making a, a character, a super a hero, was... Uh, Spider-Man, particularly those few um, reprints I was able to get of the original Stan Lee, Steve Ditko, Spider-Man. Um, it was just a melodrama. Uh, you know, back then, I don't know if I made the connection, but Peter Parker's life seemed like a telenovela, right? You know, all this drama with his aunt. He's got a sick tia he's got to take care of. He's always broke. Uh, the media hates him. The police hate him. <laughs> and... Um, and of course, the art, that Steve Dicko art, which I can go on forever about, but just the intricacy of the movement from page to page, building the suspense, picking the camera shots. Again, as a kid, I didn't actually think that and verbalize it. But as I got older and studied it and re went back to it, I see those, uh, those important lessons that I got from those particular comics. You know, Javi, there's a with the Marvel DC and the kind of world that's sort of grown in and around that, a real sense that this is our contemporary mythology um, or certainly a mainstreamed contemporary mythology. What for you, I mean, clearly like El Muerto is also a, a new mythos that you're kind of constructing and putting in the world, but it's not the same thing. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so by the mid-90s, you know, um, I had a good job. I was, um, I was an art director at a, at a screen print company, so I worked in the graphic art department. Um, very high-stress job when, once you reach art director. It sounds really cool, like, oh, you're in charge of the art. Yeah, but you're also in charge of the scheduling and getting yelled at by the bosses and making sure the work goes out to the shop. So, um, but I had wanted to do comics, but I didn't have a desire in me to work for Marvel DC. Because by that point, in my late 20s, early 30s, 
I had read enough of the history of comics, the, the history of the comics, not the comic books, the actual people who make them, the creators who make it, people who don't get benefit, they don't benefit from their creation. So I wanted to do something independent. And by then, you know, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was already in the history books by the time the mid-90s came around. So independent, creator-owned work was what I was going to do. So I had to come up with my own character, obviously. And at the time, I was pretty definite. I wanted to create something reflective of Mexican culture. In my case, I was thinking of, okay, no one's ever, in, this is back in the mid-90s. Nobody was doing Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos, in comic books, American comics. And I saw very little Aztec mythology being used. Uh, we saw Hercules and Norse mythology and, you know, all the time in comics and movies and cartoons. So I started doing a little bit of research into Aztec mythology visually and reading about the different, you know, uh, mythological aspects of it. So I wanted to create this character who combined somehow, I wanted to combine like some Day of the Dead folklore with some Aztec mythology. And somehow I came up with this idea of this young man, uh, Diego de la Muerte, 21 years old, born on Day of the Dead, on his 21st birthday, he gets killed in a car accident. He wakes up in the land of the dead, Miklan, and then he comes back to Earth a year later, transformed into this uh, undead uh, avatar. But um, and that, that was the start of it. And that's was, that was my reasoning to make my own comic. I wanted to express myself as someone who loved comics and loved that medium, but I wanted to make it through a vehicle of a Latino, a Mexican uh, superhero. Certain, it certainly struck a chord with us um, and, of course, with the mainstream. I mean, you caught the attention of a, you know, a very important director. Um, it went on to you know, be made into a movie. Do you want to, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, it, it goes back to what I'm always harping on for creators is do interviews when they come up, when you get invited, do the interview, no matter what it's for. I mean, you know, within reason, if it's some, you know, some weird organization you don't want to be associated with. But so I did an interview with NPR. Um, they had actually come to San Diego Comic Con in 2000, 2001 in the summer. Um, and they were interviewed, I forgot the, the reporter's name, but he was ahead of his time in 2001. He was trying to interview specifically Latino comic creators. Um, so I was one of the ones he talked to. So, you know, he comes to my table, sits next to me, 10-minute interview, takes off. So I figured, okay, I did my interview. Maybe I'll hear it, maybe I won't, but at least I'm getting my idea out there, especially to an NPR audience, which is nice. Um, eventually, that thing gets aired, and um, Brian Cox, the independent film director you uh, mentioned or alluded to, he heard it. He happened to have been driving down um, PCH, which is out here by LA, Santa Monica. It's like this really fast thoroughfare along the beach and I found out later he was hearing listening to the interview in his car and I guess he's driving stick so he's trying to get a pencil and he's trying to write down the information as he's on this perilous uh, <laughs> highway um, but he got a hold of me eventually and long story short you know his assistant contacted me actually and we heard your interview and we can't find your comics out here and at the time meltdown comics on sunset so they sent me some money I sent him the, the couple of comics I had and um, from there, you know, a couple of years process. Eventually, they got he got a producer, and then they had some financiers who wanted to make a film, any film really. So it kind of worked out right from the beginning. We had we had money to make this film that everybody wanted to make. So um, yeah, that movie came out in 2007, starring Wilmer Valderrama. Um, I had a cameo in it. There, you got to have your creator cameo, and. Um, as far as I know, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll let the film historians look into this. It's, I, I, yeah, I think it's the first film based on a uh, Latino American comic book. Um, and, you know, it's independent black and white comic. So it's kind of in that yeah. vein of Ninja Turtles, American Splendor, but it's also absolutely foundation. Big boys. Yeah, yeah, it's foundational. Um, and I, as you know, you and both you and I are sort of immersed in popular culture. And yes, I, I would say this is the first, um, for sure. So, um, Javi, tell me, tell me about manga. 
I mean, this is extraordinary. Wow. So yeah, tell us about that. Manga. Yeah. Well, manga for the listeners out there who don't know it is the Japanese comics that they call them manga. Um, I've always been a fan of that. My exposure to Japanese uh, pop culture would have been first, uh, sorry, animation. So as a kid, Speed Racer was my primary entry point, um, Gigantor and such. Um, so, you know, as I got older, I was able to get my hands on more manga and to be more translated manga in the early in the 80s and such. So eventually after I did the first El Muerto, I had always wanted to do some type of manga type of story, you know, Japanese type um, character with a giant robot. So instead of creating a new character, I go, well, let me just take El Muerto and make this person called what I call Manga Muerto. So he's this uh, younger teenage kid in Japan, a foreign exchange student from Mexico and Japan. And through some shenanigans, um, he gets control of this giant robot called Skeletron, which he controls back then in the late 90s with the flip phone. Um, so it was just my way of playing in that Japanese creator sandbox you know, using a lot of the giant robot tropes and such. Um, and since then, I've done two other short stories. So actually, I think this year or next year, this year is actually 20 years since the Manga Muerto character was uh, began. And now it's been 22 years since El Muerto actually started. So been in it for a long time. <clears throat> Javi, how is, um, do you know what the Japanese, I mean, how has it been received in Japan? And the reason I ask is people are really surprised when I tell them that Latinx, U.S. Latinx pop culture, culture in general, like lowrider culture, et cetera, lowrider magazine, it's like off the hook popular over there. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's big in Japan as one, that one song goes. Um, you know, as a kid and even getting older, I was always fascinated by the spread of so much manga and especially anime throughout it's all over the world but it's so big in central south america and mexico and i always thought i used to think well because these cartoons are made in japan and you know the older cartoons the characters always had dark hair black hair i think uh latin american audiences just you know resonated with them for some reason that's that was always my thinking um but i have a i've had a, I, have, I have one friend in japan um we met just online saw my stuff and such and i sent him a copy of it of manga muerto so he, gave, he liked it. He's like, hey, this is good. You know, he's all, you know your manga, that's for sure. Um, so I, I just love that cross-pollination, uh, cross-pop cult, cross cultural uh, pollination. There's a new word for you guys. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a two-way street, you know. I, the, the love I have for the manga and particular creators there, Osama Tezuka and Go Nagai of Devil Man and Mazinger Z fame. Yeah, another foundational uh, creation here, uh, really, um, Javi, bringing a kind of this, synch this synergy, right? This, uh, this um, between manga and the Latinx story uh, that you created with El Muerto. Tell us about the new story world you are creating. Yes, uh, so I'm, I'm currently working on the second graphic novel, uh, El Muerto, Casa del Diablo which follows the previous book, El Muerto, Days of the Dead. Um, so in this story, it continues. He's still down in Mexico. Uh, the last book ends up, he ended up at a, at a circus freak show in, and down in Mexico by Mexicali. And in the new book, he's literally driving from Mexicali to Tijuana. So he's driving on that, uh, I guess, fabled or legendary highway there up in the mountains, La Rumerosa. I think it's a road between... Mexicali and Tecate, and um, it's like a treacherous mountain road, or used to be, and you're trying to make it safer, but, so, as he's crossing the road there, he uh, sees this car uh, crashed over down in the ditch, and there's a woman in the car, and it turns out, he goes and helps her, and it turns out this woman is trying to find her child, her child has been kidnapped, her infant newborn has been kidnapped, and the only clue she has, even though she doesn't believe it, but she's a mom trying to find her son, so she'll do she'll move heaven and hell to find the child. The only lead she has is this uh, La Llorona type myth she heard about, about this woman that steals the kids and takes them up in the mountain. Um, so I, I made up my own uh, Llorona type character um, in the story. So it's got, it's delving, in, again, delving back into Mexican folklore and such. And 
I'm doing a, a preview comic. Like the first 26 pages are actually done. So I'm doing this preview comic and some other special editions uh, in my first ever Kickstarter. So um, you're talking about world building. Kickstarter itself, that's like its own world as far as uh, distribution, you know, getting fan support and such. So um, those are the, the two current things I'm working on is the new story and then this Kickstarter campaign. I'm really excited, Javi. Uh, can you explain to some of our viewers that and listeners who might not know, what is La Llorona? La Llorona, it's one of our, I'm sure most people have seen one of the movies, like there's a recent movie a few years ago, and then there's been Mexican films of it. It's just this old legend that parents would scare the heck out of us with, and, you know, comes to the out late at night. But depending on the variation you hear, it's this woman who is said to have drowned her children. Um, and then, of course, this is where our Catholic guilt plays into it. And, of course, she's later wandering the countryside looking for her children, the ones she actually murdered herself. So, like I said, there's very variations of it. But, boy, I mean, you know, you talk about a country or a culture with this, um, like, this universally known uh, folk legend. Uh, Yorona is definitely, you know, one of the big ones in, in the whole world. Yeah, I love that you go to these spaces that we have in our, that we heard growing up. That's very kind of a part of our culture. But then you reinvent them in a very contemporary way with your comics. Yeah, the whole reason I made El Muerto back in 98 was, yeah, I wanted to bring those type of things that I've known about or maybe heard about and wanted to know more about. But really just to put it out there in front of another audience, like, hey, comic book audience, you guys are all into, you know, we're all into Marvel stuff and Star Wars and whatever. Here's some uh, Mexican folklore, Aztec mythology. I think you should check out because it's, it's rich. It's as good as any other world cultures, mythologies and, and legends. So, um, you know, I don't look at myself as a custodian of that stuff or a, an expert, but I'm definitely using it for inspiration. And hopefully people will go read more about La Llorona and check out those old classic Mexican films. And maybe they'll do more deep dive into Aztec mythology, Mayan mythology, and start looking all through Central and South America. Um, it's, you know, it's a good entry point, the stuff I present. Like, I'm doing my stuff for myself because I'm trying to tell exciting, rich, interesting, creative stories. Um, but if it inspires people to go beyond that and start looking at some, you know, digging through old books and museums, whatever, that's, to me, that's gravy on the, on the train for me. That's, that's, that's excellent. Absolutely. You know, um, just really kind of as we move to the next slide, the next uh, part of our conversation, it's so important because also the media, mainstream media, as you and I both know, you've written uh, sort of beautiful pieces for some of the books that I've done, where we talk about the fact that the mainstream forgets to anchor you know, Latinos, Latinidad, the presence of that, if it is there, in any kind of cultural space, in any kind of, you know, history or sense of, you know, La Llorona more than just as a symbol, as something that's kind of cool or that's something like there as a, as a kind of suspense piece. Um, Javi, you do so much work with uh, kids, you work in schools, you do workshops with comics creating. What is the process behind your making of comic books first? And then we'll move into kind of how you take this to other spaces so they can kind of follow and find this space for telling their own stories. Yeah, um, the, some of it is necessity as far as teaching. So again, I told you I had this screen print job. And then in uh, 2008, when the economy they had that horrible recession, world recession and Everybody was losing their job. Well, I was one of those people who lost their job, which was a, it was a huge shock because, you know, even though I was doing the comic by then, um, there's that whole stability, right? You have a job, a weekly job, you have a weekly paycheck, you have insurance, big important thing. So anyway, after getting home over the shell shock of being laid off, um, I was one of 10, 15 people at the, at the place. Um, I go, okay, I need to keep some revenue coming in besides the comic and convention. So I go, well, I could teach. I mean, I know comics. I love comics. I'm sure I could teach it. So 
I started teaching at my local uh, community centers, libraries, been doing it now for 16, 17 years. So my process, the way I teach, everyone's got a different process. Um, and I don't mean, to, I'm, not, I'm not trying to demean myself or, you know, I almost try to do it just a couple of levels up over say like a babysitting type environment in other words these kids come in and they want to do comics you know they want to draw stories so i don't bog him down i used to right i used to bog him down with well let's start with the history of will eisner and the spirit like you know what we love him but little kids don't want to hear that stuff so i, I pretty much just let the kids come into class, provide them the paper and pencil, give them some minor instruction, but they're ready to get their ideas off on the, on the, on the paper. It's just, a, it seems to be very instinctual picture making. Yeah, that's great. What, what, am, what are we looking at here, Javi, in terms of your process? So you've got ah, yes. all this, I, these ideas in your brain and now you've got to get them out on a piece of paper, papers, and they have to tell a story through dom the visuals primarily. Like what's going on in your process with page six, seven, and then your final page here? Yeah, so people always ask me, what's your process? And again, ask every writer, cartoonist, there's different pro There's no right or wrong answer. I want people to know that because people get, oh, I don't know how to do it that way. Don't worry, do it your way. All that matters is the final product, to be honest, right? That's all the reader cares about. What's the comic look like? What's the movie look like? Is it good? Do I like it? Is it bad? Is it boring? I mean, that's the basic thing. For me, I never. I've so I've never written for my 22 years of making comics. Um, I've never written a script. I never typed a um, a summary. I just think of the story for weeks or months or years, and then I just get blank sheets of paper, um, what we used to call typing paper, but photocopy paper. And I just start literally, like people see on the screen there, the, the two on their, I guess on their left, yeah, the, the chicken scratch stuff. I just start drawing the comic, the story. Really, really sloppy, really quick. Um, these are probably drawn nicer than normal. Sometimes I make almost stick figures. It's just to pace it out. The two people are talking, the angle looking down at the box of comics, whatever, this and that, uh, another shot. So... I just, it just unspools from my head. I jot it down. I even, I'm, in this case, I have some dialogue written out there, it looks like. Um, and then, so th those are two pages. So the graphic novel, the new one I'm working on, that's what it's from. It's like 110 pages. So I do a lot of edits. I go back and I look at all 110 pages. I may throw out page 50 and 52 and redraw them, or I may expand it to four more pages. Um, so it's just my rough draft, it's my manuscript. Once it's done, then like image on the right, then I draw it on the large 11 by 17 paper with pencil. And then that's the black ink you see on that paper. And then I scan that. And so I do, I do all the drawing and then I scan all the pages in the computer. And then I, I digitally letter my comics. I don't, I don't hand letter it because my writing is as bad as a doctor. I want people to read this stuff. <laughs> really, really interesting to see, actually, if, when we move, go from uh, your, your thumbnail sketches on page six on the left to the final copy, what's included, what's expanded, uh, how you use that negative space to really push the story, the visuals kind of into the reader's space. Really, really uh, instructive. So thank you for sharing this. Um, yeah, and, and, and every mm -hmm. artist I know loves to look at another artist's process. Like, we're still, we're all fascinated. It's not like we're like, oh, I know how it's done. I don't care. No, I want to see how you do your manuscripts. I want to see how she does her painting. It's just a, and the general public seems to like this stuff. Absolutely. And, and then, of course, the kind of moment when you guys share the things that uh, you're not so good at and that you avoid, people are like, wow, okay, now yeah, I know yeah. why, why Javier avoids, I don't know, uh, drawing dinosaurs or something. Um, or right? streets, streets things, like a whole street scene with a bunch of cars that are like, yikes. Okay, well, there you go. Okay, <laughs> street scenes. Um, yeah, so you, you've talked about your methods for uh, teaching comics and with kids. Let me, um, why Latino Comics Expo, Javi? I know you did this with Ricardo and it's ex like really first out of the gate. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, so I'm the co-founder with uh, Ricardo Padilla of the Latino Comics Expo. 
Uh, started in 2011, which means 10 next year is 10 years of this. Wow. Um, how did it start? You know, there's, there's two or three stories that we put out there. Uh, because it's you, Frederick, a dear friend and a trusted colleague and everybody else listening. Um, I was up in San Francisco for a convention, I'm sure. And me and Ricardo were walking the streets of San Francisco. I'm sure we're probably going to get some good food there in um, the Mission District. Um, and he stopped by these, in front of these two buildings across the street, kind of both like in semi-completion. Uh, and he's like, ah. Oh. I go, what's wrong? Well, you see the one on the right? That's going to be, they're going to be opening soon. That's the new Jewish museum that, you know, they built in. And it's going to be a big thing. And then the one on the left, was supposed to be the Mexican Museum, the new one. And I'll, I'm going to watch out my words here. I don't want to get sued. Something happened with the Mexican one, the financing, let's say. So I guess it wasn't going to get completed at the time. That was That's what I was told. So Ricardo was bummed out. Ricardo's a huge patron of the arts. I mean, he loves comics, but him and his wife have a very nice art collection. They're always buying Mexican, South American, Central American art, painting and such. And he was bummed out, understandably, because, you know, his city wasn't going to get that beautiful Mexican museum. And, you know, Ricardo, he gets, when he's bummed out, he's bummed out. <laughs> and I just like, well, I go, okay, I can't do anything about that. I go, maybe we can, um, and I just literally spit it out. I made up the words. I go, maybe we should just create like a Latino comics expo. And he's like, what's that? And I had to think about it. I go, well, I, you know, I know a lot of people over the years as a publisher self-publisher why don't we just get a bunch of artists together latino creators let's get them together for a weekend and do a little show and um i remember i told him i go well look uh i think he suggested let me try the cartoon art museum which is a very prestigious um comic book museum right there in san francisco i guess the biggest one on the west coast um you guys got your wonderful billy ireland museum there in ohio um so he said he was going to try them. I go, well, try them. Because I'm thinking, why are they going to say yes? I mean, you know, they don't know who we are. I go, try them. And if not, we'll just go to the American Legion Hall down the street or something, get something cheap. So I go home. He calls me like a couple of months later. Hey, Javi, they said, yeah. I go, who said, yeah? He's on the Cartoon Art Museum to do the Latino Comics Expo. I'm like, oh, man, we're going to do one. Huh? Okay, so... Uh, I contacted about 10 or 12 artists I know, friends and other artists from the Bay Area. And then we put on our little humble show uh, that one spring day, beautiful spring day in um, San Francisco at the Cartoon Art Museum. And then I remember you coming out. I think you came out to the second one, if I remember. But um, I, I, think I, only, I think I only missed one. Um, I can't remember. But anyway, it was... Uh, we, you all started small. I remember being there. I, I, I want to say on the first, the first session, I hope I was there for the first session. Um, but, and then it grew into this like magnificent, you know, uh, expo. Yeah, we've traveled. We've done a show in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, we partnered up with our mutual friend, Teresa, Dr. Teresa Rojas at Modesto College uh, last year in San Francisco, San Jose. We've done a lot of shows in Long Beach with our friends at MOLA, Museum of Latin American Art. Um, we'll be announcing shortly. I know people have been asking with everything going on, everybody, every show being canceled and rescheduled. So me and Ricardo will be making an announcement about that soon. Um, but yeah, it's been wonderful. It's grown and it's just so great to see the odd. It's great to see the artists, the, the writers and everybody just so glad to have a space like this. But, and I'm sure you know with your SoulCon, Hearing from the audience, the attendees, young and old, of all types, all colors, how much they appreciate being able to walk in a place like this. And I call it like a one-stop shopping. You come in here for the weekend, and it's just all either Latino creators or people doing Latino-centered books. And after this show's over, I tell the artists, now make sure you go out to all the other conventions, exhibit everywhere. Don't just get stuck, What I, the way I say don't just do Latino shows. Your product should be seen by everybody because you want to educate people and you want to expand your audience. Um, so, you know, now, nowadays, man, there's probably about four or five Latino uh, centered comic shows across the country, which to me and Ricardo, we're like, wow, this is amazing. I mean, and I hope there's more, I hope more pop up. 
um, because that just shows that there's so much burning passion that people want to get their voice heard and people want to find these products to buy. So absolutely we're, st we're we're still very hungry we're still very hungry and you know it is important to get our stuff into other <laughs> spaces but um there's something really healing and there's something extraordinary about the kinds of synergies and work with one another that creates new spaces that has happened because of the latino comics expo um javi where is the vitality in latinx comics today yeah, this segue is perfect. It's just, it's just things are just multiplying and multiplying. Um, the vitality, it's not in one part of the country, which is good. It's not in just one group of people. It's not just guys doing it. It's not just girls, not just straight or gay. The vitality is in every single Latino person out there who's creative and sees us and sees other people, they want to create. They want to get their voice out. So the vitality is everywhere. It's inside, it, it starts inside you, not to get all corny, but it has to be your desire to get that thing out there. Um, so it's everywhere. You know, when I first met you, Frederick, and I remember you were nice enough to contact me for one of your, you, you did the first, you did the first major book, only book at the time, on Latino creators focusing on them. So you contacted me and I think 30 other people to do the book uh your brain on latino comics the all-time classic um so at the time i remember getting the book at home and reading it like yeah i read my interview first but then i read all the other ones and like okay there's about 30 people in here and at the time i'm thinking yeah there's probably like another 30 that i know of maybe in the country i'm sure there was more but nowadays it's your job to keep on top of this but me there's no way i could even list you know 50 creators, Latino creators, because I know there's another 200 I probably missed. So there's just so many. Every year, there's just so many more. There's more young people doing zines, you know, like, again, Latino creators or Latino-themed uh, books, zines, comic books, graphic novels, web comics, political cartooning, uh, children's books, um, just everywhere. You know, I, I want to see this more happen, t happen in animation and film. Hello. But thank God, comics are such a good economical, I guess it depends. Some people say it's too expensive. But it's a great entry point to create something and put it out there. So I think that's why you're seeing such a huge explosion of uh, Latino-created content in comics and zines and graphic novels. It's the gatekeepers from the media, the major media, the movies and the, car and the animation industry, maybe video game too. That's where we still need a lot of work. Um, because you kind of do need to go with a, even a small studio producer to get a sizable animation or film project out there. But comics, you know, I think we're far surpassing the other mediums as far as Latino representation. And uh, Javi, you have been so important and so selfless, so giving in helping to mentor and open those spaces for this legion of new generations of comics, zine, um, other ways of uh, storytelling creators that are coming out of our community. It's absolutely amazing. Gosh, Javi, thank you for talking, sharing a little bit about the way you uh, build story, story world building, go to our mythologies to make new mythos, and Latinx comics and why they matter today. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Frederick. And folks, check out Havzilla.com. You'll find all my social networks and info on my Kickstarter. Thank you. That's right. And the Kickstarter starts on Wednesday, if I'm right. June 24th, worldwide launch, 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Exciting. Thank you, Javier. Thanks, Fred. Thank you.